I want to break this down. We're going to go to John 14 today. We're going to move over to Exodus chapter 3. We're going to talk about the orphan heart. But I want to tell you today that the most important thing that I could do as your leader, as a pastor in your life, is not to give you the do's and don'ts of your life. That's not the most important. Hey, don't drink. Don't do drugs. Don't do this. Don't do that. That's not the most important thing that I could bring to the table. I think the most important thing that I could bring to the table in your life would be this, who you're becoming in Christ. Just pointing you to the right or in the right direction of who you're becoming, right? So that's that's my goal today. That's my goal in preaching this specific series of just saying, guys, look, it's not about what you're doing. It's about who you're becoming. An orphan always focuses on what they're doing. A son or a daughter already knows who they are, and they're just becoming the fullness of that sonship. They're seeing the fullness of that sonship or that daughtership come to fruition in their life, right? So, so the greatest asset, I, I, this is stuck in my head this week for some reason, I'm telling you, it's just stuck, but the greatest asset you have in your life is your relationship with Jesus, that's the greatest asset. I don't know if you're a business guy, business lady in the room. I don't know if you got a lot of investments or retirement funds or whatever that may be. But if you have a retirement fund or if you've got some investments, if you don't watch it, I don't have my phone with me, but I find myself sometimes pulling my phone out and checking a few things. Sometimes what we have to do is we got to pull our spiritual phones out and check our spiritual life because that's my greatest asset. All of this other stuff that I have, River, Abby, Kaylee, Jill, if I go on to be, you know, with Jesus before them, they'll inherit all that. But that, that's, it's not about leaving an inheritance, it's about gaining an inheritance. You know what I'm saying? So, so I've got to be sure that I've got the gain of inheritance first and foremost in my life, not just leaving one, even though leaving a legacy and inheritance is a very, very good thing. But John chapter 14, we're going to read 15 through 18. Listen to this. I'm going to read one verse, actually. It's going to be the shortest sermon I ever preached. I'm going to read this, pray. Kenzie's going to come back out. They're going to receive the offer, and we're going to go home. <sighs> Wrong. Okay. If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay. Hello, if you, it don't get much clearer than that. I mean, go back and study that. And, and here's what you're going to find if you go study the commentaries and different things like that. Here's what you're going to really break down and find out after the, you know, days of study that you put into it. Here's what Jesus meant when he said it. If you love him, you will keep his commandments. If you really love him. So my goal, my job, but my, my, my greatest desire is to get you to fall more in love with Jesus. Don't just fall in love with an atmosphere of a church or fall in love with the way that a pastor delivers a sermon or the way the worship leader leads worship or the way the people greet you and, and smile at you when you come in. Don't just fall in love with that stuff. First and foremost, you've got to fall in love with Jesus. Because if you fall in love with Him, here's what's going to happen. You're going to start keeping His commandments. When you keep, see, keeping His commandments is a byproduct of falling in love with Him. And then it's like a domino effect after that. Once you do that, then what's going to happen is all of these things that you've struggled with over the years because you've fallen in love with Jesus and now you're being obedient to God and you're keeping His commandments, those things, now Jesus begins to have the opportunity as a son or a daughter to clean your life up. Orphan thinks totally different. Let's go on to verse 16 just real quick. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I, he, he adds an and in there, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, an intercessor, an advocate, right? A comforter. That's the Holy Ghost. I said it. Come on, those of you who like the King James Version, it's a ghost. Woo! But he's going to give you another helper that he may abide. Say abide. That he's going to abide with you when you're good. He's going to abide with you as long as you're okay with him. No, that's not what he says. He says, I'm going to send a helper. I'm going to give you another helper, right? In verses 15 and 16, by the way, anybody that's not Trinitarian, you really have to take out verses 15 and 16 of the Bible of John 14. Because he literally mentions Father, Son, the Holy Spirit in two verses right there. And he says, look, I, the Son, am going to pray to the Father, and he's going to send you a helper, right? And that helper is going to be the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever. 
In other words, no matter what you do, no matter where you go, I think it was in the fourth service last week that I talked about how when I gave my life to Jesus and I woke up the next day, actually I didn't give my life to Jesus, I prayed a prayer to Jesus. I, was, I hadn't given my life to Jesus yet, but I was like, God, would you just let me go to sleep kind of a thing. And I fell asleep, and when I woke up, the helper was there. The helper was there when I woke up, like for real. This is pre me giving my life and saying a prayer over my life. The helper was there. That's how I know the helper will abide with you forever. God's spirit will always be there. What did the helper do? He led me home. Why? Because I was an orphan. All right? I was away from the father's house. And God was trying. So the two words that God spoke to me through the helper in the house I was in, okay, which was not a great atmosphere, all right, uh, 109 pounds, addicted to methamphetamine. In that house, I woke up in that bed, and God spoke two words. The helper spoke two words to me. You know what he said? Go home. That was the two words. He said, go home. So when people say that the helper can't speak to you unless you got all of these I's dotted and T's crossed, they are a lie from the pit of hell, and they're probably living out of legalism at best. Okay? Because Holy Spirit will speak to you and He will be with you and He'll help guide you and comfort you and lead you in times where you would think the Holy Spirit ain't around, okay? But Holy Spirit will be in the drug house. Holy Spirit will show up wherever Holy Spirit needs to show up because God loves you and you're not an orphan, okay? So let's, let's go back, let's go back, verse 16, that he may abide with you forever, verse 17, the spirit of truth, because that's what it is, he's the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, the world cannot receive. Now when you read that, you go, oh, the world, the world can't receive it. Well, we know that the world can receive, that for God so loved the world. So if you, lead, if you read the scripture just reading it, well, the world can't receive. That's why some people go, I just don't understand the Bible. It's because, look, you didn't understand your spouse. But what did you do? You studied them. Right? What, what's, what, what's her favorite color? Hey, girl, hey, what's up? What's up? What's her favorite color? Blue! What's her, what, what kind of flower does she like? What color flower does she like? You know, roses, red or white, yellow, pink, oh, black. Mm. I'm just kidding. But do you, you, get, you get what I'm saying? You know, we study people out to get to know them intimately. So what you have to do is you've got to study the Word of God out so that you can get to know the Word of God intimately. A son, I mean, you know, you don't just, your, your mom or your dad is not an acquaintance. Why, you know them. Jesus is not some acquaintance to you. You should know God. How do I know? You study, you spend time, right? It's not that you make this some God in your life. These are words that were inspired by Holy Spirit. So as a son or daughter, I know that I still run to the Word, but I also fall at the feet of the person who inspired the word. So I go straight to the source, right? But he says the world cannot receive. What he's meaning right here when he says the world is those who are influenced only by the desires of their flesh. So he's saying, look, the world, the people who act worldly, do you know that you could be in a church and still be of the world? That's why some people say, I'm not of the world, I just live in the world. You ever heard somebody say that? What they're saying is, I don't live in the flesh anymore. I live by the Spirit. And worldly beings and things and mentalities don't understand living in the Spirit of, uh, of a living God. They don't understand that. And he says, because it neither sees Him, right, the Spirit, or knows Him. Worldly people don't. Because if you did, you wouldn't live according to the flesh. But he comes back, and this is the positive side of the verse. He comes back and he says, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Verse 18, he says, I will not leave you as what? 
orphans, I will come to you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to come to you. Now, you got to understand this, and I'm sorry for taking a little bit more time, but I, I think we have to understand the word as we teach it. So, so you have to understand this. Do you understand that this was like probably a maximum of five to six days before Jesus would have left the earth? Maybe not left the earth because he stayed 50 days after he revealed himself to about 500 people. But to the majority of people, this would have been five to six days before Jesus went to the cross and died. So he's looking at these people and he's going, hey, I want you to know I'm not going to leave you as orphans. They don't really understand that Jesus is fixing to be crucified and die, and he's going to, to, to go into a grave, but he's going to come out on the third day, right? This is some post-Easter sermon stuff. So he's going to come out on the third day, but, but listen, he, when he ascends into heaven, he's not going to leave you as orphans. He's not going to leave you as orphans. He's going to come to you. How is he going to come to you? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is now going to come. That word leave is, is, is afi ami, okay, in the Greek. Afi ami, afi ami. And I've been studying this. Afi ami. <laughs> Makes me sound so smart or dumb. I don't know. But here's what it means. It means to depart or to abandon. He says, I will never leave you. Afi ami you. I will never do that. I will never depart from you, and I will never abandon you. He had to tell these people because he knew. He had to have known that these people would have been thinking about being orphans after he left. Oh, God, what are we going to do? Jesus is gone. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, Jesus has a plan, and here's what Jesus was saying. I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving. Physically, tangibly, you're not going to be able to touch me because I have a purpose. I am deity. I am God. I'm going back to sit at the right hand of the Father. I am going to prepare a place for you. John chapter 14, verses 1. We read other verses in John 14. John 14, well, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In other words, you're not going to be orphans. I'm going to prepare a place. He knew that we, at moments in our life, would temporarily have this temptation to feel like an orphan in situations that we go in or go through. And here's what most orphans do. They operate out of their feelings. Has anybody ever operated out of your feelings? Come on, raise your hand. Anybody ever operated out of your feelings? You ever done something and because of how you feel, you respond to the situation because of how you feel. Here's how I like to break it down. There's reality and then there's truth. And the reality is you in your personal being, in your earthly, fleshly, carnal being, do feel the way that you feel. Those, those emotions Depression is real. Can I get an amen? amen? Anxiety is real. All of those things are real. We could talk about all of those things. They are real. That is reality. That's why some people go, well, preacher, I get what you're saying, but I'm a realist. Right? I'm a realist. I look at things in a real way. Well, okay, I'm glad you're a realist, and I'm not against realists, okay? I love looking at things and going, hey, we really got to look at this. This is real. This is real, but I'm glad this is real, but let's go back to the truth. Because I, I, I understand, what you're going through is real, but the truth says. I understand you are full of anxiety and you're overwhelmed and the doctors put you on the maximum prescription, but the Bible says cast all of your anxiety before him. That's the truth. And, and, and when we give over our anxiety, the Bible talks about this peace that surpasses all understanding that can come upon us. That is the truth. You know, the reality is, yeah, you've just went through some things in your life. That's the reality. As an orphan, you can't make a decision based on your feelings. you got to make decisions based on the truth, which trumps feelings. Hello. 
And I think we have a great example in the Bible. His name is uh, Moses. And Moses was one of those people that, that's probably operating, not probably, he was. He was operating out of feelings, okay? So I'm going to give you four questions today that Moses asked that I think can relate to us. Because I think as an orphan heart, if you have an orphan heart, you're going to ask these four questions, always. You're always going to point back to one of these four questions. There's probably 12 that he had, but I'm going to highlight these four, all right? The first one is this. Who am I to do this? You do know that Moses was an orphan, right? His mom did what? Put him in a little river, right? Put him in the river. Whose who's daughter come and picked him up? Pharaoh's daughter come and picks him up, and he's raised in someone else's home. He's an orphan. So he has this heart within him, and he knows where he came from. He understands where he came from, but he's been raised in this environment. And some of us, here's our thing, we know where we came from. We know that, that before the foundations of the earth and before our mother even pushed us out and before I was formed in my mother's womb, that God knew me. We know where we came from. We know that God is our creator. We know that God has a plan, but we've been raised in a whole nother environment. And so that's, that's Moses. And he says, who am I to do this? Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. Let's check this out just real quick. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I, say I, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now hold on a minute. Who am I to do this? I, I just want you to know, Mr. Moses, you're not going to do it. I'm just going to use you to get it done. See, that's where we get messed up. Because we really think sometimes that it's about us. See, that's an orphan heart. An orphan heart tries to take what? Control. They try to take control. They, they think if it's, if it's not them, then who can do it? And then when you start putting the pressure on yourself individually, here's what comes up. Self-doubt and insecurity. And now you're insecure and you don't know. And you start asking these questions just like Moses was asking the questions of, who am I? Who am I to do this, God? I mean, who am I to go before Pharaoh? You're, you're missing the point. Some of you, God may be calling you to do something in the church, in church world or in the secular world. It doesn't matter. God will call you. You know, 2% of employment is in religion, right? Which means 98% of people who are employed work in the workplace, so God will use your gift and your talent in the workplace, but sometimes as God is using us, we go, oh, who am I? But uh, I just don't know. I, I don't know if I could be president of the bank. I mean, I'm not sure. I, I've always looked at myself as the teller. Nothing wrong with the teller, but if God's called you to be the president, right? But what do we do? An orphan heart always goes back and says, but who am I? Let's go to the second question. What if they won't accept me? It's not just who am I, but what if they won't accept me? We find this in Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Let's look at this one just real quick. Then Moses answered and said, but suppose they, but suppose they, they. Boy, that is a powerful four-letter word. Suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. What does he say? Suppose they. Suppose they actually say the Lord has not appeared to you. Can I give you a word of revelation today? Who cares what they say? I think one of the biggest problems that we have as sons and daughters of Christ is we're worried about what they say, not what he has said. He, look, Moses, he is calling you to lead people out of Egypt. If God is calling you to lead people out of Egypt and he has spoke to you through a burning bush and the bush wasn't consumed, wake up. Some God is trying to speak to you and all you're worried about is this fear of rejection when you begin to step out of the boat to walk on the water. I wonder if Peter said, I don't know if I can step out of the boat. What, what about what the other disciples are going to say? Who cares what the other disciples are going to say? That's a word for somebody. Some of you need to quit worrying about what your brothers and sisters in Christ are going to say. Because some of those guys are just jealous. Amen. 
Because God's calling you up. God's been calling them up for years, but they won't come up. Now God's calling you up, and you're scared to go up because they don't ever go up. Come on. And now you have a fear of rejection, and you don't know what they're going to say, and you have this need to be accepted when you've already been accepted because the Bible says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Come on, let's go on before I get too excited. I'll run up in this place. Hey, I'm about to run. <laughs> let's go to the third question because not only is it who am I to do this or what if they won't accept me, but what if I'm, this is a big one, what if I'm not competent? You ever feel, uh, felt unqualified to do a task? I want to tell you something. There's a prayer I pray, and I, I, w- I would say every time, I would probably say it's 98% of the time and I have to repent when I don't say it. But y'all don't even understand when I'm standing on the front row and my heart is beating really fast. And I know I have the responsibility to preach to hundreds of people and to teach His Word. And my heart is just beating and my prayer goes something like this. God, I cannot do this without you. I need you. I will utterly fail before these people if I do this by myself. I need you. Would you just be with me today? Anoint your servant. I just want to say what you want to say. It's not verbatim, but that's the prayer that I pray 98% of the time when I stand in the pulpit. Why? Because I don't feel qualified for this. If you only knew, man, I don't feel qualified for this. This is not me. This is Jesus in me. Jesus caused me to do this. Jesus brought the gifting and the talent or something. I, I don't even know. This is not me physically. This, this is, I, I know what he's saying because I've had those Moses moments where it's like, man, man, I just don't know if I can do this or God gives another opportunity. You know, I'm, I'm going to preach, uh, man, I'm probably preaching more than I preached all year in like the next couple weeks. Uh, out of town. So th- this conference called me. They want me to speak. And then I'm going somewhere else and speaking and, and doing some stuff and a men's conference and all this stuff. And I'm going, I can't do this. I can't. And then you just start. Anybody ever done this? Y'all know what I'm talking about? I think this is the moment that Moses had. His heart was just beating really fast. And this anxiety had overcome him. And he's going, man, but, but I... I t- I'm not competent. Let's go to Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, and look what he says. He says, Then Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. I don't have it all together like all these other people. Why are you picking me? Why is it me that you're screaming out my name and I'm showing up in the middle of a desert and the bush is burning and the thing ain't even dying? And I'm hearing you and I'm feeling you. But then he takes it deeper. And I think this is where it really relates to us. Because sometimes God will call, and we expect when God begins to speak to us that we automatically change. And we don't change. Anybody ever experienced that? That God spoke to you, and now you're trying to change, but you don't automatically change. And now you're trying to figure out if it was the devil's talking or if it was God talking. This This is what he says. Listen to what he said. Neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. I wasn't eloquent before, and honestly, since that little burning bush experience, I haven't been eloquent since. You haven't changed me. I don't understand why you want to do this. And then he goes on, he says, do you not understand? Do do, do you not understand? Mm. God, do, 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 do you not understand that I, I, I'm, 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 I'm so, so, slow, so, slow speech and slow of tongue? Most people said that he would have a speech impediment. And what we naturally do is if we have a, a speech impediment or if we have a flaw to us, You know, I'm thinking of people maybe with autism or something like that, that we categorize people and we set them over here and we go, oh, well, yeah, yeah, they're they're different. So let's set them over here. And we want to go out and we want to go look for the people who are eloquent, 
who are not slow to speech, who are not slow of tongue. See, God don't choose people the way that we choose people. God's not going around going, who's, who's driving the Range Rover? Who, who's driving the nice car? Who's living in the nice house? I, I want to use those types of people. That's, that's not the people that God uses. Even though he uses those people, he's not looking for those specific people. He's looking at people who are disqualified so that when people see them, they go, this must be God. This must be God. It's why he said in the scripture that he would use the dumb to confound the wise. Any witnesses do I have in here? I will raise my hand because I am not the brightest bulb in the light socket. Come on, somebody. But I will tell you this. God in me is brighter than anything the world could be. And right here, he's looking at his own self, and he's going, I'm just, in, I'm incapable, I'm unqualified. Y'all have heard that statement, right? God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the call. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's good preaching, you know, just, hey, well. it makes It makes for a good little shake for a minute. But isn't it the truth? That he doesn't call the qualified. And, and, and you know, what I don't like about that statement, i got to back up. What I don't like, because I believe that God does call the qualified. But he calls the unqualified too. Amen. It's not, his word says that he's no respecter of persons. If he would have been a respecter of persons, it would have allowed us to have an orphan spirit. Amen. And an orphan heart. But he's no respecter of persons. If God did it through me, he can do it through you. And I know you think, yeah, that's right, but I'll never be that. This is my pulpit. I don't know what you think your pulpit is, but if you think that this is your pulpit and this is the only pulpit that people can preach the gospel from, you are wrong. The foreman, the new foreman job that you just took is your pulpit. Sitting at that drive through window saying, welcome to McDonald's, how may I help you? That is your pulpit. That's your pulpit. God will use you no matter what. It's not that you're incapable, unqualified. It's not that you got this spiritual stutter in your life or, or you're always self-reliant. You can't do anything but. No. You are a son. You are a daughter of the Most High God. Or let's go on to question four or we'd be here all day. Because it kind of leads. If you see these, the question, who am I to do this? What if they don't accept me, right? What if I'm not competent? He goes on and he says, can you send somebody else? Isn't this where we get sometimes? Can you just send someone else, God? I mean, come on. You kind of see my life. You see what's going on. I've, I've just went through a divorce, or I just come out of an addiction, or I, I, just, I just got out of jail, or, or you know, I, I just went through some things that I probably shouldn't have went through, God. I mean, you know, me and my wife still together, or me and my husband still together, but I, I was caught in adultery, or, or, or whatever it may be. God, surely you could just send somebody else. Exodus 4.13. Look, look at what Moses says. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. How many times have we done that? God, I know you want to use me, but I don't want you to use me. Why? Because I've made this all about me. And it's not about your power and your spirit and your forgiveness and your love and your grace and your mercy and your hope and your love and your joy and your happiness and all the other things that can come with you. It's not about that, God. It's about how the enemies condemned me and made me feel less than. And, and I, I'm now loathing upon all of the mistakes and the things that I've made in my life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stop. Stop. Because what you do is an orphan heart, the orphan heart that we see in Moses was a very passive heart. Let me just turn my head to the call of God on my life and maybe God will use somebody else. And the truth is, God will use somebody else. He will. Because through this whole questionnaire with Jesus or with God in, in the Old Testament, right here with Moses, I will tell you, God got mad at Moses. He was upset. All the way to the point that he wanted to kill him. Yeah, that's tough, isn't it? Why? Because he was so passive. But Moses had to do something that you and I have to do. He had to find out who he was. 
It's not about, I said this last week, it's not about what you're doing, it's about who you're becoming. It wasn't, it wasn't just about him going to Pharaoh and asking Pharaoh to let my people go. It was about who God was making Moses. It was who he was making him. It's who he was becoming. So he had to discover who he was in God, not just himself. Because if you always look in the mirror and only allow your knowledge to go as far as what you know about yourself, you will always talk yourself out of God things. You can't do that. And what spiritual, see, I think they're spiritual orphans. I'm not talking to orphans today and, and using the terminology as orphans as people far from God. I think they're spiritual orphans in the local church. I think there, is, there are literally people that have been saved, they're going to go to heaven, but they'll never experience freedom and restoration and fulfillment in their life because they have an orphan heart. They'll, they'll split heaven wide open, man. They're going to heaven. They'll finally experience what Jesus said you could have on earth, heaven on earth. That's how he taught us to pray, right? They'll finally experience that stuff in heaven while they wasted 60 of their Christian years on earth struggling, being bound when they didn't have to be bound, right? Being broken and, and, and messed up when they could have been restored or not living a fulfilled life in Christ when God could have fulfilled them on this earth as a son or a daughter. Y'all with me? Let, let me give you a few more examples, okay? Let, think, think of Elijah. Y'all remember Elijah? Uh, Mount Carmel, 450 prophets of Baal. I'll give you a short story real quick. Uh, the two people come together, and they said, well, let's see whose God really is God. And they come up with this deal. And they said, Whoever, whoever's God answers by fire is the true God, the true living God. And they build this altar, and the prophets of Baal got around the altar, and they begin to pray to this false God, and nothing happened. And I love it. you got to go back and read the story but I love it because Elijah comes back and he's taunting them Elijah's the one that be, that, that's doing the taunting and he's like oh <laughs> your God must be at lunch <laughs> oh oh he must be taking a nap oh okay get out the way and Elijah says put the altar back in order which is a whole nother sermon Put everything back in order. And by the way, just so that y'all know that he is the God of heaven, I want y'all to bring a bunch of water. Pour that water all over the altar. Y'all know that water and fire does not match, right? So if the wood is all soaked up in water, it's hard to get wet wood to burn, right? Naturally, it's hard to get your wet wood to burn. Because that's what we have. We've been drenched with the water of the world. But when God's fire falls on us, it will quench everything. It will consume everything. And that's exactly what we see. He didn't have to beg God. He didn't have to sit around. The Bible says he prayed and the fire from heaven come down and consumed the sacrifice that was on the altar. And the God of heaven, the maker of heavens and the earth, now became God to all these people. And he sacrificed, I mean, not, maybe not sacrificed, but anyway, he killed the 450 prophets of Baal. Greatest victory of his whole ministry. But guess what? He was rejected by Jezebel. Sometimes in your greatest victories, the greatest spiritual victories you'll ever have, immediately a Jezebel will come up. I'm going to preach on Jezebel one day. It's going to be a standalone sermon. We're going to talk about Jezebel. Because I think Je people, people run into Jezebel all the time. Jezebel is running loose in churches today. And she has taken a bunch of people with her. But rejected by Jezebel, what happened? Greatest victory, what happened? He runs to a cave, isolates himself, because that's what an orphan heart does. As soon as you get opposition, what do you do? You run to a cave, isolate yourself. Oh, woe is me. And I'm not making fun, but that's what you do. And then he makes a statement. He says, I'm the only one left. And God comes back with a voice and he says, no, you're not. I've got thousands. I want to say it was either 5,000 or 7,000. Was it 7,000? Prophets that I've called. Don't you dare say that you're the only one. That's an orphan spirit. That's an orphan heart. See, a lot of times we're on our greatest victories. We run from God. Or what about Aaron? You remember Aaron? Moses, who we're talking about, right? Moses goes up onto the mountain. He's getting the Ten Commandments. And guess what? The people are impatient. Sounds familiar. 
The people are impatient and they're, they're waiting down at the foot of the mountain because they can't even go up on the mountain because the Spirit of the Lord is so strong. And, and Aaron is down at the foot of the mountain with all the people and now he is beginning to sense rejection by the people because the people's looking at him going, hey, Moses has been up there for way too long because we're part of the microwave generation. And if we order at, the, at Burger King and we place our order, we want, we want the order to be hanging out the window by the time we get there. If not, we're going to post on Facebook of how not to go through the drive-thru at Burger King because the order takes too long. It took them six minutes. This is the generation we live in, and it looks like that it was the same generation. So here's what Aaron did. Aaron actually, this is a deeper thought than, than I really want to go into, but Aaron took the gold and the jewelry off of their ears and their, 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 neck, uh, their necks, and he began to make a molded calf with the very thing that God had asked for them to sacrifice and bring as an offering before. But now they're taking their offering, their gold, jewelry, all of this, they're taking it off and burning it and molding it into a golded calf. Why? Trying to please the people. Y'all want that to be a sermon? I can preach that sermon. People pleasing? Because I, I think that orphan people try to please people all the time. I may do that one in the, in the six weeks. Let's go to Joseph, Joseph's brother. Uh, Y'all remember Joseph, right? Could you imagine being in the family and you're the 11th child? Anybody have a baby brother? Anybody got like the baby brother? The last child was a little baby brother. Anybody? Anybody love their baby brother? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. Y'all lying right now. You're lying. You're lying in church. Nobody loves their baby brother. That's a little sarcastic. But we all love our baby brother, right? But, but here baby brother is, but what if baby brother got treated so much different from daddy that daddy made him the first tie-dyed shirt of all history? The coat of many colors. Come on, somebody. He makes him a coat of many colors. And not only that, but now jo uh, Joseph is having these dreams, and now he's saying all of his brothers are going to bow down to him. Joseph's brothers had orphan hearts. They not only were rejected by their father, but they became jealous and insecure. And that's what an orphan heart does. And I'm going to free some of you guys because we all do this same thing. They had a hard time celebrating that their brother, their younger brother, was going to win. If you don't watch it, something will come up on the inside of you. Somebody's, something's going to jump in you right now if this is you. And it's okay if it is you because you're in the right place. But look, if you see something, you scrolling on Facebook, you going through Facebook, I always use Facebook because everybody's on Facebook or Instagram or, or the gram, TikTok. America fixing to take that away from you. You better tick on your talk. It's ticking. So all this stuff. And, and you, you're just scrolling through and you, and you see somebody. And they're talking about, oh, look, 72 days sober. You're like, yeah, but you ain't going to make it to 75. Because I know you. See, that's an orphan heart. You're jealous. You're insecure. You're looking at other people, trying to live your life through other people. And when someone else is successful, or God is doing something in them, but God ain't doing it in you, you try to attack them and get them down on the same level that you are. Stop it, you orphan. That's not the heart God gave you. God didn't give you that heart. He gave you a better heart than that. You are a son and a daughter. When you see someone succeeding, you ought to be just as thankful for their success as you are for your success. That's why I always say, if you don't have the right understanding of your own personal identity, everything in your life will be out of balance, no matter what it is. Everything's going to be out of balance. So the orphan has an earthly mindset. I'm almost done. Here's what an, an earthly orphan mindset says, okay? I must do, I got to do something to do what? To have something to be something. I've got to do something to have something to be something. So in other words, I was talking to a, a couple after the last service, and they come up to me, and I said, just think of it like this. Think, think of success. In order to have success, I must do something to be successful and then I'll have something, and then people will then call me successful. Because I've done something, and now I have something, now I am something. 
That is totally backwards to a son mindset, to a son and a daughter. You don't have to do anything because you already are. Where did this mentality come from? I'll tell you where it came from. It came from the devil himself. His name was Lucifer. Do you all remember Lucifer's role in heaven? He was the worship leader, right? What happened to Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve was in the garden. Okay? We're going back to the basics. Okay, who tempted Adam and Eve? The snake, the serpent. Who was the serpent? Lucifer. Lucifer was the serpent. It was the spirit in that serpent, right? So that serpent began to say different things. What did that serpent say? Which, by the way, Lucifer was what? The first orphan. He was kicked out of the father's house. Where did the orphan heart and the orphan spirit come from? The devil himself. That's why it's not good for you to have it. What did he say? Eat this fruit. If you do, you'll have what God has, and you'll be something significant. I got to do something, to have something, to be something. That's not a son or a daughter. See, a son or a daughter has a kingdom mindset. Here's what the kingdom mindset says. I already am. Already am. It doesn't matter what I do. Take this pulpit away from me forever. I already am. I am. Therefore, because I am, I have. Therefore, because I am and I have, I can do. I don't do first. I do last. See, it's totally backwards. Orphans live a... you gotta, you got to stay with me because this is a little bit deep. Orphans live a life for God. Is there a bad thing? Living a life for God? This is why I'm saying spiritual orphans, you can be a spiritual orphan, go to heaven. You're living a life for God. What are you doing? I'm just living for God. Living for God. Is there anything wrong with that? No. But here's what sons and daughters do. They live a life from God. It's not just for God. They live a life from God. They're not living for a being. They have the being living in them, and they're living from that being. Does that make sense? This is why we're called human beings, not human doings. You're a human being because you have become. You are a child of God. You're a human being. You're becoming something. He became sin so that we could become what? The righteousness of God. Not so that we could become just like the world. We are becoming the righteousness of God. And here's the theme all throughout Scripture. And I'm, I'm done. Kenzie, you can come out. Here's the theme all throughout Scripture. I love you. Do you see that theme? All throughout Scripture. I love you. An orphan heart wouldn't believe that people really love them. No, God says, I love you. God says, I am with you. I am with you. I'm going to send a helper. I'm with you. Every breathing second that you have, whether you're asleep, uh, what did David say? David said, if I escape to the depths of hell, you would be there also. That's what he said. I can't run from you. That's what David was saying in the Psalms. He's like, I can't run from you. You may could run, but you can't hide. You, you may walk away from God, but his spirit is always going to be chasing you down because he loves you. He's with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you, right? What's another thing? Do not be afraid. For God did not give us a spirit of fear. See, an orphan heart will bring fear into their life. They, they'll begin to function out of fear. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. And here's what he said. And this is where I normally was going to tell my little story about my experience. Here's what he says. Common theme throughout the scriptures. Come home. Come back to God. Come back to God. Because God has a plan and He has a purpose for you. Matthew 27, 46, it says this. At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now listen, Jesus became an orphan on the cross so that we would not have to be orphans on the earth. He took it. He felt it. He took your sin. He felt in that moment what it was like to be away from the Father. Very first time. 
I know I say that all the time, but it's, it's just such a, an amazing moment that Jesus had to experience all this stuff. And in this moment, he felt what we feel like when we're away from the presence of God. He became so that we be- could become. He became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God, right? He became so that you become. If you don't watch it, you will always live in a way to where you never become. And God has that for you, right? Let's pray today. Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for these these precious moments of the Word of God where we can just break things down and just have conversations and talk. And I pray that this word today has pierced the hearts of people who need it, including myself, God. There's just things as I preach that I go, wow, man, God, your word is so good. Father, there's moments in my life, even, even the last couple of weeks, actually about four or five weeks since I've been studying on this topic, that I go, wow, I live, I live out of an orphan heart in that area. Boy, I live out of an orphan heart in that area. And God, it's just, it's growing. It's repenting. It's saying, God, I'm sorry for looking at you in a specific light or in a specific way and just help me walk through this process that I'm going. It's that continual uh, uh, rebirthing of a soul. It's that continual reminding that you do of, of me actually being a son of yours. So, Father, if there's anybody in this room that, that really needs a reminder today, you are a son. You are a daughter. You do not have to function out of an orphan heart. You don't have to say, who am I? You don't have to say, am I qualified? You are who God says you are. It doesn't matter what anybody else says you are. You may not feel qualified, but God's going to help you through that whole process because it's not about you. See, that's the orphan heart. It's about you. It's not about you. It's about God. So, Father, we give you praise in this place today. We thank you for speaking to us. And if there's anybody in this room, maybe you're watching online right now, if there's anybody here, and you say, man, I've been living out of that orphan heart. I'm ready to run back to the Father. I'm ready to say, God, I'm your son. I'm your daughter. Help me through this process. I've allowed some things to distract me. Maybe you need to confess some things over to God. Just get some things right with Him. Nobody's looking around. Every head's bowed. Every eye's closed. Would you just slip your hand up in the air real quick? Slip your hand up. Anybody? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, if you're online right now, it's not even really about the raising of the hand. I do that just to see who I'm praying for. But it's about what's happening on the inside of your heart. The scripture says that he'll take a heart of stone and put a heart of flesh on the inside of you. Flesh not meaning worldly things, but just a soft, pliable heart. That's what we're doing right now. So say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, in this moment, I declare your goodness over my life. My heart is not lined up with your heart in this moment. I confess that to you today. I confess my sins to you today. And I repent of those sins. I turn away from the things of this life. And I point myself towards the cross. Would you use me? for your benefit would you show me your ways when I don't know the way I declare today that I am a child of the living God thank you for saving my soul and for being my Lord in Jesus name amen amen come on give God a big hand clap today